Well, hey there, fellow soldiers, and welcome back to Appropriating the Culture. I hope that you've been enjoying this course so far, but regardless of whether or not you like it or think it's worse than Watergate... This is very different than Watergate and more dangerous in many ways. Nobody asked you, Bernstein. But criticism and critique is a fitting starting point for today's topic, which centers on judgment. I'm Pastor Shane. I'll be your judgmental neighbor today as we appropriate some culture. As we said before, one of the reasons that Christians are bad producers of art is because we're bad consumers of art. To be good at the craft, you have to study the craft, but you can't study the craft if you think it's going to corrupt you and lead you down an inextricable path that condemns your soul to the fiery depths of hell to be tortured for eternity. No movie is worth that. And so many Christians don't engage in the arts out of fear, prudence, self-preservation, or a combination thereof. But there is another reason why Christians do not engage in the arts, and that is due to the judgment from fellow Christians. Let's be honest, would you really want for everyone at church to see your entire DVD collection or to know your entire video playlist history? That would probably make you squirm a bit, and not just because you watched Paul Blart Mall Cop 2 39 times for some ungodly reason, but because we feel pressure to conform to the sensibilities of other Christians. Now, if we're talking sin, you should feel shame and you ought to be condemned, but as we said before, sin is not external. It's not stimuli. It's not even Paul Blart Mall Cop, though it gets close. And just like with the Pharisees who were adding to the law, erecting makeshift boundaries, and judging people based on an arbitrary standard of man-made traditions, we can do the same thing. And we can certainly feel the societal pressure when people look at us askant and say, you're eating with tax collectors and sinners? That kind of judgment from fellow Christians can limit us from living in and engaging with the culture, which is a rather important thing to do if we're going to, you know, appropriate it. But I think when it comes to judgment, there's a lot of confusion among Christians because to properly understand it, we have to approach our Bible systematically, not just one or two verses, but taking all of it into account. Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. Oh, but well, never mind then. I guess we're done here. Don't judge. That's it for us today. Follow me on the major socials and I'll see you back here next week to appropriate some culture. Okay, obviously not really. We all know that there's more to this. Jesus himself institutes the model for church discipline in Matthew chapter 18, and church discipline necessitates and requires judgment. That's how all church discipline starts. You have to judge someone and say, hey, you're doing something wrong. When Jesus says, do not judge, he's talking about the manner in which we judge, which he makes clear to us in the next verse. Do not judge or you too will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. Jesus here is judging our judging, and in his judgment, judging hypocritically is particularly egregious. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Don't judge hypocritically. First, judge yourself, and then you can judge others. But I don't want to minimize Jesus' words here when he tells us not to judge. I think it's more than just judging hypocritically. As Christians, we're not to rush to judgment or have a judgmental spirit. God is the judge, and we should leave most judgment to him, particularly when it comes to things we don't know for sure, like the eternal condition of people's souls. Now, we can probably be reasonably sure of the fate of Hitler and Stalin and Tom Brady, but those are things we don't decide, and we should be content with God as the judge. Judge. As James says, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So we don't rush to judgment, we don't have a judgmental spirit, and we don't judge hypocritically, but some judgment is required, as we see with church discipline in 1 Corinthians. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? 
Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Expel the immoral brother. That is the final step of church discipline, which necessitates judgment. But you'll notice that Paul makes a further distinction. We are not to judge those outside the church, but we are supposed to judge those inside. He doesn't mean the building. That would be weird. He means we ought to judge those who claim to be Christians. Of non-Christians, he says this, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. So a couple of things here. Number one, Paul, like Jesus, doesn't want us to leave this world, but to live in and be among the immoral people, eating with tax collectors and sinners. And number two, Paul is judging those outside the church in a sense. He does call them immoral. That's a judgment call. And Christians need to distinguish good from evil and call sin, sin. This is more about accountability and jurisdiction. It's like when you're out in public and you see a spoiled, out-of-control, snot-nosed little kid who's verbally abusing his own mother and you just feel a sudden urge to put that little cretin in his place with a good spanking or two or three. But you don't because it's not your kid and you don't feel like being arrested today. In the same way, we're not called to discipline non-Christians or to hold them accountable to our standards. They're not our kid. And we're not called to judge those outside the church. But for those who claim to be brothers, Paul says this, But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. And speaking of eating, appropriate in the culture is brought to us today by Mount Olive Garden. If this is to be your last shared meal together, make it a good one. Gather around our table with two or more for all your awkward church conversations. Correct, rebuke, discipline, and beat your wayward son with our unlimited breadsticks. Turn them over to Satan to save their souls and save yourself some money while you're at it with our reasonably priced menu. Mount Olive Garden. When you're here, you're dead to me. Alrighty, so when Paul tells us to not even eat with the sexually immoral or the greedy or idolaters or slanderers or drunkards or swindlers, you might be thinking, wait a minute, some of my closest friends and family are sexually immoral, greedy, slanderous, idolatrous, drunken swindlers, because let's face it, aren't we all? We're all sinners in need of forgiveness, and God forgives us completely and totally when we confess our sins in repentance and we need to forgive others in the same way. But contrition and repentance are necessary conditions for forgiveness. The church discipline escalates based on whether or not the person repents of their sin. It's not about the nature of the sin or the severity of the sin or whether or not we sin. We all sin, especially Tom Brady. What Paul is talking about here is habitual, perpetual, unrepentant sin. At the final stage of church discipline, with that person who claims to be a Christian, don't even eat with such a person. Have nothing to do with them. Judgment can be hard, but we are called to judge our fellow Christians. As Paul also says in Romans, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? I think I read the wrong verse. <sighs> okay, what does this one say? Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master's servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. All right, so now Paul is telling us not to judge our fellow Christians, where previously he was telling us we're supposed to judge only Christians. We're missing something. So let's look at the context and go back a couple of verses. Except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Ah! There it is, disputable matters. That's what he's talking about. That's the context. We are to judge our fellow Christians in regard to sin, but not in regards to disputable matters. You see why it's necessary to approach this systematically? So now let's put it all together. We remember that God is the ultimate judge. We don't rush to judgment. We don't harbor judgmental spirits. We don't judge hypocritically. We don't judge those outside the church. We judge those inside, those who claim to be Christians. And we only judge them in regards to sin, not in regards to disputable matters. Whew, we did it. Wow, thank you, wow, yeah. I did not realize hundreds of people were in here with me. Hmm. Anyway. 
Back to the topic at hand. Now, I say all of this because when it comes to culture, most of it doesn't fall under the category of sin. Most of it is generally a disputable matter. Sin is not external. Sin is not stimuli. So exposure to secular movies, music, or television is not in itself sin. But people will say, yeah, but is it a good idea, though? Why fill your head with that garbage? Scripture says whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And that's true, and that's a good advice, and I would never tell people you have to watch this movie. No, don't violate your own conscience. Be prudent, be wise. Don't put yourself in a bad situation. But also don't condemn fellow Christians for their freedom in Christ. The Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. And we don't all suffer the same temptations in exactly the same way. Someone violating your personal standards isn't sin. And there's really no limit to that question of why. The Bible says bad company corrupts good character. So why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? Unlike Jesus, we often shrink back from that kind of judgmental pressure. But if we're not good consumers, we won't be good producers. And the judgment or the fear of judgment from fellow Christians limits the kinds of movies Christians can watch and limits the kinds of stories Christians can tell and limits the ways in which they can tell them. And the net effect of that is trying to reach non-Christians by appealing to the sensibilities of Christians, which produces artwork that is confused in purpose and audience. Well, I'd love to hear your judgmental comments. So you can send them to me on the YouTube channel, write to me on Twitter, or on my author Facebook page, and I'll see you right here next week for more Appropriating the Culture.